Welcome back. I've covered part one of the technologies of industry 4.0, so this is part two. This is an interesting and to me kind of a fun piece of industry 4.0. The idea of augmented reality is to combine a virtual and a real world together for the user. So here's a short list. Training, remote expert support, doing complex assembly work, uh, some interesting applications in quality assurance which you should um, I would suggest look into further uh, again providing digital overlays additional information on top of what a quality technician is seeing whether it's temperatures or voltages or um, you know what have you uh, pressures and volumes and, and so on different kinds of safety elements not just training uh, but guidance if you're uh, traversing or working in some sort of an environment it can overlay information that you need to stay safe in that environment and equipment maintenance is so something like quality similar to quality assurance where it's providing extra information that's maybe invisible to the naked eye connected through sensors and overlaid into what the person might see here's a uh, not a very industrial application, but one that I thought was interesting. This is a, was a result of a contest. Um, let's have a look. Now that's a bit crazy of an application that a process quality engineer might get into, but it's a fun demonstration of what augmented reality can accomplish. And it shows a very realistic, in some, in some cases, but, but also a useful interface that a user could see just you following around with their cell phone or something like that, walking around a store. Uh, I've used it to different kinds of augmented reality one of the fun applications I've done it for again as a photographer I can have an application that shows me what the night sky looks like so I can go out during the daytime or uh, and hold up my phone and in the middle of the day see where the stars will be say where the moon might rise find a location slide forward and backward through time while I'm standing there I can pick a location and then um, so my screen shows me what it will what what it will look like if I come back at two in the morning, stand at this spot. It'll be the perfect place to take a picture of this Milky Way or something like that. And then I come back at two a.m. and there it is. It's exactly what my phone showed me uh, as an overlay to the to the realistic view or to the <laughs> reality that I'm looking at. So this is some 
amazing applications for augmented reality. There's a nice local connection, again, for students of Conestoga College in the Waterloo region here. There's a company called um, North that are have created uh, something called Focals, Focals by North. And these have kind of replaced the Google Glass, which were attempted and didn't particularly take off in the market some years ago. And the Focals by North are a very good application of augmented reality, uh, but even still fall a bit short of practical use. But let's have a look at uh, what they look like. I recently came across these insane smart glasses and had to give them a try. These are probably the most advanced smart glasses out there right now, and they totally feel like something out of a Black Mirror episode. They start at $600, and I wore them for a week to find out if they are worth the price. Okay, first things first, I'm sure you're wondering what these glasses actually do. The glasses have this little projector built in that bounces onto a piece of film on the lens, creating this hologram effect that you see when you wear them. This is essentially what it looks like when you wear the glasses. When I wore them, I could still kind of see the frames in the peripheral of my eye, and the hologram wasn't crystal clear, it was a little bit blurry like this. You can control the glasses with this little ring that has a joystick. This allows you to scroll through what you see, and it also has a voice command feature, so if you want to text someone, you can just speak it and it'll transcribe that for you. So pretty cool, right? These are definitely futuristic, but you can't help but wonder if this is too much. We're already so glued to our phones do we really need all our notifications popping up in our face and like i said augmented reality is still kind of in its infancy a lot of companies are producing ar glasses and ar devices i think it's today a little more effective on a on your phone than it is on eyewear but these are consumer products available for about $600, maybe six to $900, depending on <laughs> frames and features. So a good start. There are more industrial versions of these, which are much, much more expensive and much more capable and specialized. So still lots of opportunities. This is a kind of a new technology uh, yet to come into, you know, full-fledged use, but I would still say this is a great opportunity, as are many of these technologies as part of Industry 4.0. Great opportunities for for you if you're at the front end of a career looking at options. Additive manufacturing, one of the other key pillars of Industry 4.0. This is a also a relatively new technology and although it's gone much beyond it's just its infancy it's now I would uh, suggest that additive manufacturing has already established a lot of practical applications there are a great number of real world applications real products being created through additive manufacturing the technology continues to get better and better so we're getting more accurate um, more reliable, more durable, more cost-effective sort of prints out of this system and out of these technologies. 3D printing is much more now than just a plastic printing the way it started. You can print in metals, fiber composites, Kevlar, that kind of thing, fiber reinforced, printing in food, printing proteins, printing chocolate, and one of the fields I find fascinating is printing with uh, live human tissue. So companies are producing artificial bones, hard valves, corneas, but using human material uh, or live material. So when you print a cornea, it doesn't just look like a cornea, it is a functioning cornea. So there's many, many advantages to technologies like this. Much lower prototyping cost. In particular, a lot of these things would have required the uh, creation of a mold. 
Um, and in my own experience, those um, typically run tens of thousands of dollars to have just even simple molds made, plus a fairly long time. Uh, it could be it could be weeks to develop a mold, you know, with additive manufacturing. In many cases, the molds are eliminated, or additive manufacturing can be used to develop the dyes or the patterns for the molds, so we can even improve the molding process. Okay, no machining waste, so some nice environmental savings. Um, if you're printing in metal, for example, the only metal you consume is the metal that's made or that, that's used to produce the part. And instead of starting with bar stock or large forgings and then machining away through turning or milling or grinding, creating a lot of chips and a lot of heat, consuming a lot of energy, there's none of that sort of machining waste involved. And you can produce much more intricate shapes. Uh, this design that you see here for a motorcycle frame, that may have been um, molded and welded together before, but that would have been very, very difficult to machine. And, and certainly that's the most, not most, not the most complicated shapes. You can have internal shapes and external shapes all sort of intertwined that are virtually impossible to machine or even to mold in a conventional way. Of course there's limitations to additive manufacturing. And to my knowledge additive manufacturing is still not as precise or accurate as machining. I think if I come from an aerospace background and there is no way that we were able to achieve anywhere near the kind of tolerances that we need to even start with um, for, for aerospace use. But for some of our tooling, holding fixtures, clamping devices, that sort of thing, beautiful. For automotive, we started to use additive manufacturing for some of the parts that we were producing that were perhaps a little less sensitive to uh, perfect tolerancing. Um, the surface finishes aren't as great, so sometimes you need some secondary surface finishing, uh, some grinding or some buffing or some tumbling, something like that. I don't think that additive manufacturing is yet uh, cost effective for high volume production, so high volume automotive kind of use or medical or electronics, but certainly for low volume, the cost benefit of additive manufacturing is very, very high. So I've got some examples here, uh, prosthetic devices, <laughs> chocolate roses, a full scale car printed out of fiber, plastic, fiber reinforced, uh, metal printing for motorcycle parts, um, and even here this is a, uh, a nose or face piece. This isn't live tissue or anything so um, sophisticated, but certainly there are printed ears, printed eye parts, printed heart valves, and so on for the medical industry that are being developed. The technology is also much more than just um, the traditional layered deposition of material where a print head would just build up thicknesses by printing over and over and over again uh, and each layer kind of building up a, a height to a part. So there's things like photopolymerization where you have a bath of material and um, a light would effectively cure, selectively cure the the polymer within the bath, um, and that provides for all sorts of new opportunities and flexibility in terms of additive manufacturing. You can jet material, um, you can laminate material, many many different ways now of doing uh, production through additive manufacturing. Would you eat a printed meatless steak? That does not look good to me, but organizations and individuals are working on protein substitutes, protein replacements, okay. all sorts of alternatives, and I think it's a very, very important field uh, for, um, you know, for resolving uh, hunger, world hunger, 
you know, which used to be something that we would never consider trying to solve practically. Um, but the things like Industry 4.0 and additive manufacturing are now able to make a contribution to that, which is which is fantastic, right? 3D printing. For most of you, you're going to be looking for a career um, after this, after graduating from this program. So I want to point out that things like additive manufacturing it creates a whole world of new opportunities. Not just don't think of it as just a technology that's making products. Thinking think of it as a technology that's making jobs and making career opportunities for you. Here's uh, University of Waterloo, so a local to Conestoga College, receives a 2.1 million dollar uh, investment from Toyota Motor C Company to advance additive manufacturing research. You have many, many industries, aerospace, healthcare, food, textiles, many other industries that are using or developing additive manufacturing technologies to enhance their product and their offering to customers. And so it's a, it's a fantastic field to get into. And I think it's important for today's students to understand that you may actually have a competitive advantage over the people who are already in industry. And companies will often turn to students or interns or uh, engineer in training or new practitioners to come in and help embrace, understand, experiment and develop these kinds of technologies. So I can't stress enough that it's an opportunity for each one of you who are listening to this lecture to take advantage of some of these opportunities um, and and find yourself a place in industry. I will say something like an entry level 3D printer. Now this is maybe going back to a standard um, fusion, de fusion deposition layer, which is the kind of printer that I have. You can buy these things now for three to five hundred bucks. Uh, they're a great way to learn about the technology. You become conversant in kind of how they work, some of the terminology that's involved. Um, <laughs> you certainly hone your troubleshooting skills. They do not work flawlessly, uh, but it's exciting to you know to be able to create your own designs and then print your own product and employers are going to be impressed if you can show up with being conversant and with with models that you can show a product that you've made yourself and designed yourself and there's a world of support out there these are there's, there's uh, tons and tons of forums um, sites that share their models when I've created a new model I upload it and share it to the community uh, and then I get the benefit of um, access to other developers their their own designs for Let me move to autonomous robots. These are becoming more and more prevalent in industry. They're playing a major role in manufacturing. Lots of opportunities to engage in enhancing the capability of robots, finding application of robots, troubleshooting robots, designing, developing, implementing, training, programming, and so on. So, although the natural instinct might be to think that robots displace everyone, the truth is they displace some, um, but not everybody. So there's some jobs that, um, some jobs are lost, but some jobs are gained. And I think the real task for um, people who are in the industry and people who are entering industry is to find find your own skill set and find out how you can contribute to this to the emerging technologies take advantage of the emerging technologies and, and find a home and a career in industry okay let me show you a quick video this is uh, this is quite fascinating there's a number of different kind of robot applications that are demonstrated by this in this video and uh, it's worth having a look. Some economists say the world is entering 
a second machine age. Artificial intelligence and other advancements enabling robots to do tasks that until now only human eyes, minds, and hands could handle. For this episode of Moving Upstream, we traveled through Asia to meet the next generation of industrial robots to see how they're changing manufacturing and whether they're sealing the fate of low-skill workers. We used to have to really painstakingly teach the machines step by step, program them what to do, and now machine learning is enabling the machines to figure out on their own how to solve problems. You put together the algorithms, the data, and the computer chips, and you get sometimes a million-fold improvement in the performance of a these A million-fold improvement? Yeah. And what does that allow you to do? So one really important thing to do on the factory floor is just be able to recognize objects, and that's something that only humans could do well until recently. Gawa, one of the world's largest manufacturers of industrial robots. Its main sellers are large industrial robots that do dangerous things like welding car parts. We got to see where the robots are made. The robots themselves, they're sealed off by these plastic barriers. The workers aren't allowed to be in there while they're in operation because they're making these very fast movements. The head of the robotics division at Yasukawa, Masahiro Ogawa, seems most excited to talk about robots that don't need to be walled off from humans, that work alongside employees. In the industry, they're called cobots. The International Federation of Robots predicts in coming years, cobots will lead the robotics industry. That's partially with driving startups like China-based Elephant Robotics to get in the game. He, uh, he did people, so it was just stop. Yeah. So work with people. Yeah, works yeah. with people. Yeah. In addition to being safer, the collaboration proves to be more productive. A study conducted by MIT researchers found that human-machine groups were more efficient than teams wholly comprised of one or the other. They also reduced human idle time by 85%. While traveling through Japan, we visited Huistenbosch, a Holland-themed amusement park. There we checked out its latest attraction, a robot restaurant. How many okonomiyaki pancakes can the robot make in an hour? My colleague Matt McDonald, after getting a robot mixed cocktail, Kanpai. tried the robot chef's signature dish. え、特に若い人たちの人口がこれからどんどん減っていく。ま、これがもう目に見えて迫ってる状況ですから、じゃあいかに効率的にあのこのレストランのオペレーションができるのか、いかに少ない人手で。It's gimmick by design. Back at Yasukawa, Ogawa tells us most of the customers who come to him looking for new automation solutions come from China. China market huge. And the growth ratio, very high. How high? Last year, Chinese demand for robots grew more than 20%. One reason for that is China's working population is aging. By 2060, the average Chinese citizen is projected to be 50 years old. To see the impact of industrial robots on manufacturing in China, we traveled to an area that's considered the electronics capital of the world the Pearl River Delta region. Headquartered there is Rapu, China's largest keyboard and mice manufacturer. We asked the CEO why his company is making the move towards robotics. Uh, because uh, in China have a rapid uh, salary increase beginning from 2008. So we feel the, the little pressure for, uh, from the labor side. So we decided to change a lot our manufacturing system to robot. Wages for the average urban employee in China have more than doubled since 2008. I thought I would jump in here just to let you absorb what he's talking about. The wages have gone from $3,000 a year to just over $10,000 U.S. per year, and that 
has caused the industry in China, the industrial managers in China, to say it's too expensive. We can't afford that for wages, and so we're going to replace our workers with robots. So if you have a goal of earning more than ten thousand dollars a year, then um, you know this is kind of a startling concept where an employer in China doesn't want to pay you that much. Um, I think this is a bit problematic. It's certainly something to to recognize or acknowledge. So <laughs> carry on. Rapu, he says, in the past few years, used robotics to reduce its factory workforce from 2,500 people to now 1,000. And more automation is on the way. So you're bringing more robots in? Yeah, and then make the, even the logistic will use a robot. You seem very happy about this. I yeah, 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 because it will make my company more competitive in the, in the field. And you're not worried when, when you lay off those 700 workers? No, no, no they, they can easily get jobs, no problem. I'm not so sure. <laughs> I think that statement is pretty easy for the boss to make, um, harder for the employees to make. So if you're looking at, for example, a SWOT analysis, you recognize huge opportunities, but some threats in this kind of an ocean as well, right? The CEOs in China, do you think they're being forthright? Do you think they're being accurate? Broadly, I think they are. I think that there are going to be lots and lots of jobs that are automated, millions, hundreds of millions of jobs that won't be needed because robots will do them. But there's no shortage of work that only humans can do. Indeed, in China, the category of jobs that are growing fastest are in the service sector. Is there any resistance from workers to putting these new robots in? Uh, uh, no, because uh, they have no choice. Your plant that you oversee has already been automated 80%, you said. Do you see it going the rest of that 20%? Li Zhendu, a worker at the Rapu factory, has watched as robots have replaced his colleagues. Yokanam. How, how far off do you think we are from, from full automation? Uh, nobody, so nobody left working in your department? Chinese delivery company JD is showing how automation is advancing in other industries like logistics. There are still some employees here but not at a JD sorting center near Shanghai. It's taking nearly all humans out of this process. And this is the same company that last year began making drone deliveries. This is a moment of choice and opportunity. It could be the best 10 years ahead of us that we've ever had in human history or one of the worst because we have more power than we've ever had before. The tools by themselves are not going to lift up the billions of people who are being left behind. Those are conscious choices we have to make as a society and as individuals. <laughs> Some of the key ideas uh, that I would point out from, from this video, the use of robots is expanding, expanding exponentially. They're becoming easier to produce they are operating faster, more accurately, they're cheaper, they're more capable, they're smarter and smarter robots. Applications are expanding way beyond just manufacturing use. You saw service, um, product distribution, material handling, and so on. Um, the use of these robots expands into m many more fields than just the traditional automotive or high volume electronics industries, auto, uh, agriculture, mining, almost anything you can think of. Uh, as I pointed out here, China is the largest new consumer of robots. So we'll see massive numbers of uh, higher volume production generated by robots 
driving the prices down, making it very, very competitive in the world. And, you know, opportunities and challenges again. And, and an interesting trend toward this idea of cobots. So, uh, um, which is in itself part of the Industry 4.0 initiative, right? These cyber physical systems. You, when you have cobots, they you still have operators, but now supplemented the work with some sort of a robotic device. And as robots become smarter and smarter, and with machine learning, they can learn from the co-operating worker and improve that relationship even further. So it's really cool things. Um, we'll see where it goes. Maybe you can be a part of it. <laughs> so Autobahn, autonomous robots, array. Um, you pull significant opportunities, significant threats, depending on your perspective. For some industries like automotive with high volume production, they are a significant operational advantage. But for workers in high volume assembly line type work, uh, robots do present a serious threat to job security. And I think it depends um, probably on your perspective, but, but on your own personal goals in a career, uh, whether you see autonomous robots as a, as a benefit or not. We, uh, we'll explore some of the challenges and the impact of Industry 4.0 on quality systems, and on current students and in process quality engineering in a future lecture. If you're interested, uh, there's a very interesting group that is doing development work in the, in the field of robotics. They're combining many of the things that we've talked about here, the Internet of Things, cloud computing, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, additive manufacturing, uh, combining all of this with a great deal of talent and imagination company called Sanctuary AI. It's based in Vancouver, uh, British Columbia in Canada, uh, with a mission to create ultra human-like robots. They're calling them synths. And, uh, the goal of this organization is to try to make robots virtually indistinguishable from humans. If you're interested in um, exploring this concept, I've given a link to the video here. Um, and, and the information that you can find it. Okay, last couple of pieces to Industry 4.0, last couple of pillars. One is systems integration. This idea of pulling all this together and uh, you can have both vertical integration and horizontal integration. The idea of vertical integration is from, from the development phase concept phase for product, for example, into uh, the supply chain and the shop floor control, and then the monitoring and the quality systems and running multiple machines. But then there's also this idea of horizontal expansion. So not just within one plant, but multiple plants, supplier, customer, um, and, ex and, and, and expanding coverage of Industry 4.0 this idea of integration, it considers the complete product lifestyle from inception to production, from the customer um, who is looking at a purchasing option to the customer who has purchased and using product in the field. So this, this idea of integration, right? Being a part of all these different decisions, all these different interactions and all the different parts of this life cycle. All right, last but not least is this notion of cybersecurity. You probably know yourself if you ever lost some uh, your your photos or your data files or just lost your phone altogether you personally understand how uh, reliant we've become on data and the information that we're carrying or the information that we've worked on or the data that we've stored somewhere and as industry 4.0 becomes more and more prevalent then we're going to have more and more data and generated and being used to make decisions and being used to control systems and so this data this information is becoming increasingly valuable and when you have data scientists and data analysts who are then 
not just taking the raw data, but turning it into something you know, even more useful for industry to make decisions on and so on. Again, the value of that data just continues to increase. So as quality engineers, I would suggest that your concern is going to be more about the quality of the data than the preservation or the security of it. And that's not to say we can't ignore cybersecurity. All right, there's nine pillars, uh, which I've covered. There are other elements of Industry 4.0. I would suggest that if you're entering into a process quality engineering role, you will be touched by or a part of Industry 4.0. This is, this is our current and this is our future. Consider the opportunities that you have um, that are posed by Industry 4.0 and and I'm very interested in seeing uh, where where it takes you uh, or where you can take it. Um, so thank you very much for watching. Uh, it's been a pleasure to present this information to you. I'm Professor Nelson and I'll see you in my next video.